Hey everyone, welcome to uh, the third talk in Detail Ahead. And um, we've got the great pleasure of um, um, Adam introducing uh, a, uh, a friend of hey, the courses, everyone. Raphael. Welcome. So I don't know if you want to give a quick introduction, Adam. Yeah, sure. Um, Rafael Ortega is uh, a very accomplished artist, filmmaker, educator, and um, even host of uh, an art program. Um, he is also a very good friend um, from Mexico. And uh, I'll just read briefly a summary of, his, uh, of a few things he's done, um, as it's quite numerous. Rafael Ortega is a filmmaker, multimedia artist. He has collaborated on a number of projects with artists like Francis Hallis, João Penalva, Amalia Pica, Melanie Smith, Abraham Cruz Villegas, Damian Ortega, and Sylvia Gruner, but to name a few. He has collaborated and co-authored work that has been shown in collaborative and co- oh, sorry, uh, that has been shown at the MoMA uh, in New York, the Tate Modern, Tate Britain in the UK, the Museo Tamayo and the Moac in Mexico, Malba, um, uh, Ago in Canada, and uh, the Biennale of Porto Alegre in 2011 and 2007, uh, as well as the uh, 49th, 54th, 56th, and 58th edition of the Venice Biennale. Um, that's just to name a few of the things that you've been involved in, Rafa. Um, but uh, I've, I thought of him uh, because he is someone who sort of uh, has many disciplines and many areas of interest and expertise. Um, filmmaking is really just, just one of them. And his collaboration with a uh, number of artists has uh, also made his sort of perspective quite wide. Um, so anyway, I'll, I, uh, I think this will be a really interesting talk and welcome Rafa to UEL and to Detour Ahead. Um, go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, uh, welcome to uh, everyone who's connected. I don't know who's connected, who is it? This is what I like and dislike about this medium. Um, thank you, Adam, for the invitation and thank you to the university for the opportunity to actually talk about my work. There's a couple of things that are, um, when I was having a conversation with Adam about what to talk about when one talks about one's work, and it always has to do with uh, a certain theme, or it has to do with a certain line that has been uh, kind of like checked in, 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 in the conferences or whatever. And in this case, he tells me it's about a uh, detour ahead, which is basically about, you know, decisions um that actually you know change the the way you see things the way you do things and it just takes you to another complete road that you never re even planned for so for this i will i will just kind of start giving you a little bit of a background as to of who you're going to listen to and and from where do i talk when i talk about moving image which is what i do and what i've been doing uh, pretty much since 1989. Um, so I'm just going to put a little kind of like it, frame. I'm a Mexican, um, was born in Mexico, raised in Mexico City. Uh, I was, I come from a very kind of middle class family. My father's journalist, my mother's doctor. Um, nothing very much into the arts, you know, really much. Uh, uh, um, a normal kind of middle class Mexican family. Um, and then, uh, just a second, okay. And uh, so, one of the things that uh, uh, happened when I, when I finished uh, my uh, sixth year or uh, level, or my six year levels, um, I wanted to really study film. That's what I was really interested in. I had no idea what that meant. Um, at that point, there were only two schools in Mexico. Uh, uh, those schools took 20 students a year each, between 15 and 20 a year, no more. And um, just give me a second. Can we close the door? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. That's, <laughs> That's okay. No we, we've got <laughs> airplanes. We've, we've got our own interruptions here. That's so. my son who's really not used to me doing conferences. Anyway, 
So what happened is that uh, I had to take a decision and I applied to a film school without knowing that actually at that moment in Mexico, the only way you could get into a film school is as an MA. You couldn't get into a film school if you were just finishing, you know, we're 18 years old and wanted to study film. They wouldn't take you. They would just say, you know, you need a career or, you know, a major first before you wanted to go to school, the film school. So, of course, I went and I just, you know, signed up and made an exam. And they said, what are you doing here? You know, and I said, well, I just want to make films. And, and so what are your favorite films? The first question that everybody asks you is like, what are your favorite films? And depending on your answers, they would consider you like a serious uh, film viewer or not. And of course, at that point in my life, I had just, I really had no idea what I was talking about. And I, um, and I got pretty much dismissed on the first round. It was a five round process to get into the school. So the first round, I was just like, okay, so that's it. But there was another little third school that opened, but it was a Super 8 film school, um, which was basically a really bizarre, um, kind of like a bit upper middle class thing with people who had money. Uh, I didn't have any money, and uh, you actually had to buy a Super 8 camera. And for a strange reason, I don't know why of destiny, my mother... Uh, was going to a congress. She's a doctor. She was going to a congress in Japan. And I just said, can you just bring me a Super 8 camera? So she bought me a Super 8 camera and I was able to get into the school. One of my aunts was helping with the tuitions. Anyway, I get into the school and it ends up being this really strange place where kind of a little bit of outcasts and, and uh, people who actually ended up doing, becoming part of a uh, like a pop girls music group went into that school. It was really bizarre. But um, there were three people there, three teachers who were actually quite incredible. One of them was an, a guy called Alejandro Galindo, which was a, a film director already retired, uh, who was with, by then about 75 years old, who just came and have a conversa gave a conversation about about film. And um, I was completely shocked about what I listened to and about what he talked about. I had never, I mean, it's a guy who had made, I don't know, probably 45 films. And I had never seen a film of his. Not that I knew of. Of course I had, because sometimes in TV they would have them. And I didn't know they were his films. Anyway, so I kind of like started thinking, okay, there's a lot of other things I have to start looking into. Um, uh, so. Uh, in a very strange way, I started kind of like realizing that there was a profound need of studying film to be able to to make films. So to actually to be able to make images, you would have to actually see a lot of images. Um, and this would only generate a very particular feeling and a very um, disheartening feeling that everything that you would be doing had already been done to begin with and everything that uh, you were doing or proposing was a copy of something they had just seen and you really liked. So that was a very kind of like strange moment in which I realized that film was not a glamorous thing, film was not a you know, uh, uh, something that was just also, it was not necessarily something that came out of pure uh, inspiration. It came out of a lot of work. So everything kind of like started shifting at that moment. And for reasons that I long to explain, I got kicked out of that school, the film school. And at the same time, I decided my, my my father decided that I didn't he didn't want me to make films. He wanted me to go to university and do a proper, you know, um, MA in something that would actually make give me a way of living. Um, so I left my parents' house. So I had no money. I wanted to make films. I didn't know what to do. And of course, I went to university, but public university. And I was studying, you know, Greek literature, 
and just a little bit kind of lost and but just going to the cinema you know anytime i had free um, i had a student card so i could get in almost for free to see watch films and yeah so it's, it was a very interesting time in mexico because uh, um it was a time where where still you could see this kind of like uh survey one month uh, cinematic experiences of filmmakers of international filmmakers uh uh, Mexicans have all have always been great film viewers. Uh, anyway, so I started just kind of like studying something I didn't want to, uh, and then watching films, and that was it. And and then I decided to uh, a friend of mine just said that I have somebody who uh, needs a camera assistant, and do you want to make the camera assistants for him in a sixteen millimeter film? And I said, yes, of course I can. I want to. And he said, uh, okay, but do you know how to use a 16 millimeter camera? Uh, yes, of course I know. And of course I didn't know. And it was this moment of, I, I just want to get in there and give enough, have an opportunity to do this. And so I went into this, uh, uh, my first meeting, production meeting, and I go into this meeting. And of course, me being, you know, who I, I was at that moment, I went to this production meeting of a film, of a, of a 60 millimeter school student film uh, with a suit. You know? So I wore a jacket and I put a tie and very seriously came into this meeting. And I was given, a, I mean, they, they looked at me like, who the hell is this guy? And it was the group that I was trying to make the film with, I was going to work with, were called the Jim Morrison Collective. And there were a left-wing collective trying to make a film about workers. And I come in with a tie and a, and a suit, trying to be the camera assistant. So they give me the script. Nobody checks the script. And there's like five or six pages missing. So I read the script that I, I, I don't understand because there's pages missing. And I just say, yeah, it's great. And I sit down at the table. And so, okay, so I, they say... Uh, this, the, the option for anyone else, I say, I, I lie blatantly about what I can do. Rafa, could I could I stop you for one second? I think the microphone is hitting your glasses or something. Okay. We keep on hearing this like sort of typing sound. Okay. Um, yeah, that I'll might try be to it. Keep it there. Yeah, but please okay. tell us more about the Jim Morrison collector. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so at that point, what happens is that uh, uh, I go to the first day of the film shoot, and the director. Uh, comes in and he says, uh, do you really know how to use a 60 millimeter camera? And I just said, no, but I want to learn. I really want to learn. So he said, okay, so I'll, I'll have half an hour before everybody arrives. And this is the black bag. This is a 60 millimeter Bolex camera. This is what you do. Ba 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 ba. He explains everything. Okay, do it here with this roll of film that is wasted. Try to do it again, 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 again. And I'll promise me one thing. If you don't know how to do something, tell me the truth. Or tell everyone in the crew the truth, and we'll help you. But don't lie. I said, okay. Okay. So, so that's how I started, you know, kind of my real adventure of making films was with a blatant lie. And then with a with a with a, a moment of recognition, and when somebody tells you, "Okay, you're in because you're here already. Here we can't get anybody else." But don't lie again. So that was that was a kind of a very clear moment of, and and they they were very generous in many ways. They taught me a lot. I was one of the greatest experiences I ever had because they were a collect i never thought of film making as a collective experience for example no i never thought of of film as a means of actually trying to build something together with a group of uh, uh of people and also but a, with a group of 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 workers you know so that was kind of like a shocking moment of saying okay this is this is what i i want to do uh and I started kind of working in other films out of rec 
one of the things okay so this is this is one of the detour points comes at this point so i do this film with them and i realize that this is what i want to do and that the only possibility for me to get into that is to actually work on that technical department and that took me to one very particular place which was the library off the film school and I did something that changed my whole life for years, which is something that I'm going to recommend you to do. I went to the library and I took something that is called the manual of the camera. And I actually read it. So I read the manual of the camera and I understood how the camera worked, what the buttons were for. So even if I really didn't know what they practically were doing, I knew what the button was for. And this is something that I practiced for the following. Uh, that's, I mean, this, is, this is 1986, more or less. Uh, 86, 87. And between 1986 and 87 to 1992 which is basically five years i came i went from just wanting to make films being a dropout from two different film schools to becoming a first camera assistant in 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 feature films there are two things i did one of them was read the manuals. So I read the manuals of absolutely every piece of equipment that was used in the set. The second thing I did is I worked my ass off. You know, I was working 145 days a year, more or less. So that's all I did. I would just worked, read manuals, worked and read manuals. So when everybody, anybody had a question about something, they would come to me and they would say, okay, so we want to do this. How do you know, well, how do you think we can do this? And, that? So, uh, and also it, it, it started linking pieces of equipment together. And I started understanding that in, in, in the craftsmanship of photography, it's not about, it's, it's not about, I mean, there, there is a lot of luck and, a lot of a lot of inspirational moments in which you are have to be in the right place at the right time but it also has to be with the possibility of understanding how you connect different things you know? um so i became a first uh, uh, uh first an electrician assistant electrician and then i became a second ca third camera assistant second camera assistant first camera assistant then i became a gaffer then i became a dolly grip and then I, I became an uh, a, a, a electrician for, for another project. And I, I just kept on going. And then I realized also that um, if I started looking into other kind of equipments, I could, I could actually start doing other things that people were not able to do. So I started doing reading like manuals on high-speed cameras. So I started doing high-speed photography. I started reading uh, manuals on... on uh, uh, time lapse photography or time lapse you know motors so i started doing time lapse photography and you know animation uh, so i started kind of like really uh, moving forward to the possibilities of fulfilling the, the program of what i had couldn't do at, at the film school because i was a dropout from two film schools and so there was no other place i could go um and to do it just through throughout experience and i became part of a you know a very strong group of mexican young filmmakers uh and uh we were we were a very 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 solid group um so solid that that group of filmmakers at one point decided to move to la and that is another detour moment in which you know at any given moment when you live in Mexico, or as I would think, believe most anywhere, 
you have to decide if you want to make your career uh, of in film closer to the possibilities of mainstream cinema or mainstream television or mainstream moving image language or decide the rest of the world no mainstream cinema and mainstream production are you know more or less or at that point where i the 90s mid 90s beginning of the year 2000 um was of course was reigned by Hollywood and by North American uh, uh, production companies. Uh, maybe BBC a little bit, maybe NHK from Japan. Dutch television wasn't that much into the frame, you know, at least not in Mexico. Uh, anyway, so everybody started kind of moving, and that group is from uh, is uh, Alfonso Cuaron, Guillermo del Toro. Uh, uh, I worked with Guillermo del Toro as a, as a first camera assistant in his first feature film with Guillermo Navarro, the photographer who then made, made won an Oscar for him uh, with The Labyrinth, The Pants Labyrinth. Um, I worked with Emanuel Ueski, who's the, the guy who's won more Oscars uh, as a director of photography. Uh, I studied uh, with Rodrigo Prieto in that really fun, key little film school. You know, so we worked in films together. Um, I worked with uh, uh, with Alejandro González Iñárritu in in another really small film. So you know we we knew each other. We kind of built a group together, and at one point they decided to move to LA, and I took a decision to not move to LA for one very particular reason that has nothing to do with film. I don't like LA. I don't like it. It's a city I don't like. So I went there a couple of times. Uh, I saw the possibilities of living in that city. And I felt like, you know, I really don't like, I don't like America. <laughs> End of story. It's not a place I like. It's not the place. It's not, I don't like the story they're telling about the world. So I'm just going to try to do something else. So I stayed in Mexico. The whole group moved. And they they did incredible careers. Very respectful and incredible things and at that point which is around 1993-94 um a friend of mine or somebody i had met throughout this kind of like mexico city cinema places it's going to see films and that um i met this very 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 young artist uh who just told me that he had a project and uh he was looking for somebody to do some video work in that project. He was going to visit uh, these artisans in the mountains, and he wanted to make a video, two videos, one of of uh, one of his uncles making uh, a weaving. Well, he's a weaver, so making this really really long uh, uh, piece of cloth of of uh, woolen cloth, and another video. He's, I remember very clearly, he said, so, and the second video I want to make is I, I'm wearing this, this um, uh, sparring boxing helmet with two little gloves on the sides, and I'm going to run against a wall and hit my head against the wall, and then I'm going to hit the piano, and then I'm going to run against the wall, and then I'm going to hit the piano, and, and this until I'm exhausted. And I was like, Okay, so uh, let's just, okay, sounds great. And so I started this project with this guy and, and it was, it was a, an incredible moment, an incredible moment of realizing that somebody could use moving image in another way, in a narrative that was creating something else. And so the, the Weaver video was very much an input that I, I, I mean, they, they didn't know how to make a video, so I knew how to make a bit of narrative. So I just made a, a video of a, a man weaving, you know, and and so you have want this to be four minutes long or five minutes long, so whatever, and so that's the input. But when I put the camera and I saw this guy like hitting himself against the wall, and again a grand piano, and again the wall, and, again, and I, I was like completely shocked, saying like, what what is this? What is this for? Where is it going? So once one side was being part of it 
the other one was registering it. And I and that was also an incredible moment because that's a moment when I realized, okay, there's this is this is something interesting that's going on. This is something that is happening in a very unique moment in time. And I'm putting a camera that's recording this, and this is what's going to remain of that. So, of course, the first thing I did was I framed the piano. No? So I framed the piano, and when this guy is hitting his head against the, the wall and then against the piano, and after this guy doing this for five minutes, I realized that with my little monitor that I had, but not the monitor, with my little uh, uh, viewfinder, you know, I realized that I couldn't see that he was what he was wearing, and I couldn't see that, that he was what he was doing. So he finishes this five minutes. Sorry, I have to stop you. Can we do it again? You know, because I need to make a close up. And the guy says, like, what do you mean me doing it again? I said, I need to do a close up because if I don't do a close up, nobody will ever know what's going on. So the guy accepts and then he says, okay, okay, I'll do it, but <laughs> this shouldn't happen this way, but let's do it. So he does it again. And then I kind of like, I, I say, okay, let's, let's try to put this together in a way that it's honest to the moment and so it become it became a completely different uh, language and, and a different discussion. And within that time, 1994, 90, around there, I received another phone call. And this phone call is one of the most interesting phone calls I've ever received. There's a guy uh, who calls me, and he's Belgian, Mexican. He's living in the center of Mexico. And he calls me and he says, listen, I want to make a video. Um, and I said, yeah, yeah, what do you want to do? It, you know. So he says, I want to walk around the main plaza of Mexico City uh, with, and then like a sheep, and the sheep goes with me around, and then another one comes in, and another one comes in until we have a full circle of sheep that's walk, they're walking around me. And, um, and, yeah, and then the sheep start going out, and then I end up being alone, and this is what, what I want to do. And I'm just like, what is, what, what, what's the purpose of this? Or he says, no, no, that's just, that's the, that's the image, that's the video. So I started this conversation with this, this, this uh, Belgian Mexican, or at that moment, Belgian uh, visitor in Mexico. He had been there for probably five years, six years already. Um, and, and I made this video and I'm going to show you. Let me see. Another detour moment, real detour moment. And, uh, this is show. someone who you've since collaborated with a number of times. Yeah. I, I'm going to leave this for a couple of minutes. We've not got sound at the moment. Is is that correct? There is sound. Yes. Let me see. I think we can hear you. There we got the sound.
making this image, this this progression happen um, from the original phone call to the final idea took about, I would say, three months. With a very intense and complicated three months for many reasons, but what I what I realized in in this in this moment is that um, the discussion about moving image that was happening within the arts was a completely different discussion that was happening in the film world. And that is something I found very fascinating. I honestly can tell you now that I didn't blatantly lie, but I fell into the art world without knowing absolutely nothing about it, really. I mean, about what was being discussed. Um, and I found out two, I uh, threw out me working with these two artists and then uh, with a third artist uh, called Melanie Smith, and then I started working with a, a whole generation of artists making videos. So the reason why people started calling me is because, they, one, they didn't own a camera, two, they didn't know how to make a video, and, and three, um, I, I started a, 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 like a production group with people with whom I was doing uh, commercials, you know, doing by that moment I was making films and, and TV, TV commercials like a crazy maniac, and um, and so I had no money problems. So I could dedicate the time to my free time to whatever I wanted. But I also started committing the the, the production houses with with top equipment and and post production facilities um, to help me with this projects in exchange of work of the artists. So the artist would give them print or would give them a, a small drawing or would give them something. So the people from the production company started living with art that was done, that was done, but people were alive uh, and who could also, people that they could have a conversation with. Um, and then that way we could get super special prices for equipment and for production, and which was very, very, very expensive at that time. Uh, and so through doing that, those three things, I started making work with a lot of a lot of a lot of artists of that generation, and uh, realized something completely fascinating, which is something I it's, it's, it's also made another detour in my life, is that if I sat down with an artist and I talked about film, I could talk with an artist for hours and they would all come with very strange things they would they would be fascinated by you know like uh, kung fu films or they would be fascinated by iranian uh films from the 50s or they would like lgbt films from the 70s in new york uh, they would be in in touch with this area of images that and you could talk about moving image for hours even a mainstream cinema film that was happening you could discuss and, and they would they could sit down and really find about what the film was about and discuss about what the f meaning of the film why was it good why was it bad why was the acting goodness but if you sat down with a group of filmmakers to talk about art the conversation would last about 10 minutes and that was it. They wouldn't talk about contemporary art. They wouldn't know anything about it, and they would dismiss it, and they would just not even get involved in the conversation. And so what happened is that I realized, okay, so there's, there are two things happening here. You know? uh, the film world is going towards this kind of um, sacralization or you know, turning this this into this this kind of sacred means of, of communication in a very exclusive exclusive club and then there's this other group of people who are grabbing and making moving image with whatever they have and whatever they get their hands off so 
that is an incredible moment when I realize if you have an image in your mind and that image is strong enough and clear enough, you can make it happen. You can make it happen no matter what. And this is something that really changed, really changed my perspective. And the other second thing was that one of the things that you can you can make you you can be making a moving image with an artist, and the artist and you are producing the image, and at one moment you can actually turn around and say, you know, this is a piece of shit. This doesn't work. You can't do that in film because you are in a machine that is costing so much and it's so complicated that there's a moment where you can't stop it. The machine is runs on its own. And as, as, uh, as the film, you know, so, as the, through Francois Truffaut said, there's a moment where the film is king and the film is king. And if you are working in a film, you can only not be in the set for two reasons. You're dying or you have a very, very, very close person in your family die. Whatever other reason, you have to be on the set working. So you, there's no turnaround about that. And so if that is happening and you are like, I'm a, let's say I'm a first camera assistant and focus pulling, and I'm looking at the scenes every day for a week in an eight week film. And I see that the actress is just not working. I mean, I'm a sensitive person to feel this, but I can't say anything. No, I can't say anything because the structure has no place for my comments. No? So that was another thing that it was actually very important to get to a point where you actually realized that the discussion of film was happening in those two levels in a very different way. And the people that were making moving image in the arts world were actually more open to experimenting with the image itself and the language than the filmmakers were, which I found rather interesting. So, okay, so I get to this point and I'm starting to make films and I'm making all those films and suddenly somebody comes and he says, okay, um, can you, I want to make a video and I want to make a film, uh, a video for, for an exhibition. Uh, but I want to make it for four screens. What do you mean four screens? Yeah, yeah, I want four TV monitors. You can't make a film for four screens. Film is made in one screen. So if you can't hold your language to make one screen, then you shouldn't make a film. And the guy says, no, I can what do you mean? I mean, it's, 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 you're basically, you know, just, just making, turning, putting the narrative and you're not doing anything. And so we go into the discussion and suddenly I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Let's do it and see what happens. And I finished the, the project with this person. We make this projection in this room with four different screens. And I thought like, fuck, this is, this is amazing. This is really working. This is, this is, this is real. This is language now. This is where it's going. And that, so it's, and, and of course, that's one of the funny things, you know, that happened that suddenly, you know, the idea of having multi screens and having all these things happened in the art world a lot before that in the film world, before the films, you know, before filmmakers decided to introduce that, introduce that in the film. And if they did, it's one rare film in where it happens, no? one rare moment or or it's this major cult filmmaker like peter greenaway that happens where things happen in layers you no know, and has the money and the time and 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 the crew to actually do something like that so everything and so all this starts going into different places and different moments and and i start realizing that that uh, What was interesting at that, at that particular time in the end, mid-90s and uh, up to coming to the millennium, 
was basically that there was a whole movement with the moving of democrat democratizing the moving image in such a way that anyone could make a film so it starts with people buying you know and having their super eight their high eight videos and their more portable cameras and easier to use user-friendly cameras that's it. and it evolves naturally into the phone and into the whatever it is now that we are we living in terms of moving image of uh, the web starts appearing i mean it's really a bizarre moment in which you i realize that you know four different narratives running parallel can actually build and construct uh, a particular narrative you know and for me that comes from a you know a very traditional way of seeing things and a very formal way of looking at moving image boom you know suddenly i realized that Yes, the narrative is built in, a, in, in in new ways, and there are two possibilities, or I or I go into that pos that narrative possibility, or that narrative possibility will come over me and it'll just you know just completely demolish what I believe in, and and I won't be able to understand what's going on, you know? and that is exactly what I think that what's happening. I mean, in in terms of 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 moving image nowadays, no, and I think that that's that's also an important point in which I say, okay, I'm going to make a bet, and I'm going to try to dedicate myself to that particular area of the moving image, which is linked into the art world, and linked to the art world implies a certain discussion in which i'm going to have to study contemporary art and i'm going to have to understand to what are they talking about when they are not talking about moving image in film no so it's really interesting that at that particular point i th i think okay i think i know about film but now i have to learn about art so i have to start studying i have to start all over again and study you know who did this what for what reason and, and and discuss about it historically and where does it come da, 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 da. and throughout this um i started meeting very strange people in the art world who actually wanted to make films um and i'm going to show you a very particular strange experiment that happened in the year 2000 which is the turning point for me in which I decided to actually stop making any commercial work, uh, not any commercial work, but because somebody has to pay the rent and, and sometimes the art doesn't pay that much. Um, but definitely leave it as my main principle and main way of expressing, uh, of making a living and try to make it on the other side. Okay. And this, let me just. Give me a second, and I'm sure it's here. Okay, just let me see. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Go. There we go. Raph, I think we, we're not seeing, we're just seeing you. Maybe you have to share the screen. Share the screen. Yeah, give me a second. There we go. Window. Share. There you are. Yeah, all good.
Дик, пойдем снимать. Пойдем, пойдем. So somebody invites me to make, uh, an art historian invites me to make uh, a visual essay on uh, Eisenstein and his unfinished film, Que Viva Mexico. And I decide, okay, so let's just try to do it. It's, it's film. It's, 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 it's film. Let's just do it. Anyway, so we work for two years. We try to get money. Some money arrives, some goes. Anyway, we, we make the film. And uh, I sit down with him. And this sequence that you just saw, which is a sequence shot in 16 millimeter, um, we wrote absolutely every frame that you see. And every frame has a connection to a frame made by Eisenstein and by his photographer Edward Tisse is connected to the 1930s muralist movement and the artist who actually um, uh, influenced uh, the work of, of Eisenstein. Um, anyway, so it's, it, was, it was a really dense kind of 
bet and and um and I thought like yes well you know this is this is this is a way to go this is a way to keep on doing projects that actually um you know uh, deal with this presentations and this kind of like language and and anyway this film goes on and uh, lives for many years uh in very small festivals when we get to we went to like 10 or 12 festivals with the film um and one day uh, i'm invited to present that my friend the director olivier de Boras, died in 2007 or something like that and in 2008 i'm invited to present the film somewhere and i go and present the film um and i talk about a little bit the, the what i am presenting today to you this ways in which i have changed and i started making art work with artists uh taking uh, moving image language to the art world and sharing it with the art world and then coming back to film and 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 i present the film and then this woman asks a question and she says i think that um i think that you should go back to film because the film would would feedback in a very interesting way of what you have been doing this years this many years and I could turn around and I said, listen, I think this is film. I think what I do is film. I think that what I make with artists is, is film. I think that, that it was a moment of kind of like a very strange enlightenment where I, re, where I said, yes, it's, uh, just because it doesn't happen in the cinema, it doesn't mean it's not film. Uh, just because it doesn't happen in a screen, it doesn't mean it's not film. It's not the language of moving image that is actually evolving. And then you start reading about all this kind of particular moment of rupture. And yes, cinema has become a, is, is what we now know as cinema, you know, film and cinema. It's actually now being talked about as proto cinema, you know, like prehistoric moving image, you know, one screen, you know, the language. This is, and now because. The moving of its language has, has evolved in so many other ways that that what was considered an artistic form in the 20th century, it's just the proto, the, you know, the, the nucleus and and beginning constructed uh, constructive block of a very complex uh, language that is being developed right now, which is moving image. And Rafa, sorry, yeah. um, this is really, really interesting. But I think we're we're coming actually close to to an end here, um, and I I want to make sure that we have um, time for a few questions and answers as well. Um, um, but uh, Dan, are you there? Can you hear me? Sorry, a bit of a technical issue, but you mind? Yeah, I can hear. You. Um, is, is it? Do we have a little bit of time to to go over some of the questions being asked in the chat? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, probably got like five, you know, five six minutes, some of that. Okay. okay. Sorry, Rafa. I, I wanted to let no, you no go problem. on, but but um, but unfortunately, we have um, some speakers lined up. Um, no problem. No problem. I, I, I do see that we have quite a few people viewing, and um, and that have been really interested. Jasmine uh, says, I'm really getting how uh, key tenacity is the most crucial in carving out your own space in an industry. Thank you. Brilliant insight. She also asks if you worked on Kronos with Guillermo. Yeah, I, I did. I did the uh, first camera assistant in Kronos and, okay. and, and all the kind of like the design of the complex shots, the mechanical design of complex shots. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, it was the fifth film I was doing with Guillermo Navarro. So, yeah, we were a very, I was very close to that group of, uh, that Kronos is a film I worked with. Yeah, loved working uh, with Guillermo. Amazing. Um, and uh, Bronwyn is, uh, says, hello, thank you for the talk. It's been really interesting. I'm a photographer, but I'd really like to experiment with moving image. Do you have any tips? Yeah, just two, three things I have to say. One, which questions that I'm asked all the time, which is the best camera? Answer is 
the best the camera you have your hands on. That's the best camera. Don't ever expect to have a camera to make image. Always use whatever you have because that will take you to something else. That's the first one. The second one is um, I believe in collaborative project. I believe that that is one of the most important lessons in my career is that if you want to make moving image, if you want to make image, you can you use collaborative project. It doesn't necessarily mean that you make a, you know that you're doing something with somebody else, but you have to establish dialogues with people. So you have to establish you may, you can run a project with another uh, another photographer who's running a project does not necessarily have to do with anything with your project, but you talk about the projects and you dialogue about what is better and have an eye that is not your own to talk about the image. Dialogue builds great images. I couldn't agree more. I think uh, collaboration is definitely key and it's probably what most separates uh, the world of a photographer and the world of a filmmaker. Um, that's, uh, uh, that's I have great. a question, actually. Hi, I'm yes, Simran. Yeah, hi there. Uh, I wanted to ask, how do you usually plan your films? Also, is there like a film technique you prefer over any other technique you ever used? Okay. Detour moment in my career. I don't own equipment. Mm -hmm. I have a camera, which is a, a decent camera. Uh, I mean, now I have a DS, DSLR, a, a, a Mark II Canon 5D. No, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a camera just so that where I can do tests and that because I believe that each project each project needs a texture needs a color response and needs a, a, an optical uh, uh, proposal so you can't own that equipment if you own expensive equipment you're going to have to sell it to the project and I think that sometimes being in touch and also very importantly not the top of the line equipment is the best equipment for your project. Sometimes if you use two or three generations behind, you can get it for cheaper and you can get it and you, and you can get even time to test it because rental houses don't have use for it anymore. That would be the thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really needed that answer because I've been looking into upgrading my equipment, but I was like, I'm not sure where to start and if it's a good idea, but now I think I got my answer. So I would say thank you so much. No. Rent, rent, rent. Yeah, it's all about renting. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you, Rafa. I think, I think you missed a third tip. Was that only two or, or, or are yeah. you going to keep the third, Yeah. The third, the third thing is is um, tests. I think that one of the things that have made me one of the trademarks that I have is I make tests with the people I work with. Uh, uh, that makes it easier. Why? Because when you discuss image, it's a lot easier to discuss image with images than to discuss it in abstract language. So if you describe an image and I describe, if I say to you, a man in a window uh, with a purple background and some uh, fish flying in front, I see an image and you see another image. So if you jump into production to that of that image in particular, which is a very particular and strange image, you might think, oh, well, the fish are so big. I never thought about the fish so big. They have to be smaller. And so... You make a test, even if it's a rough test, and then you discuss about the image because you discuss about the image with the image. Thank you so much, Rafa. I think that's all we have time for, but that was super insightful. And I thought it was particularly interesting, this uh, shift from the commercial narrative film world into the art world and and how that allowed for a lot more sort of experimentation and 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 the sort of input uh, uh, from you as a creator and that the machinery yeah. was able to be to be something that you decide on and that didn't have a life of its of its yeah. own. Um, and the last, but, the last uh, thing I'm going to say about it to, the, to, to your students is you all have an image in your heads. We want to see it. We need to see it. Make it happen. We need to see those images. 
Thank okay. you so much again, Thank Rafa. Please, much. yeah, that's yeah. great advice right there. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll be seeing you when you come back from Argentina. I will. Thank I will you. you. Okay. Thank bye you bye. Very much to everyone. See you there. Phew. That's fucking brilliant. Yeah.